Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of our Google Earth Engine for Land Monitoring application series. Uh, my name is Zach Bankson, and I'm based out of the NASA Ames Research Center in California, along with my colleagues who are joining me for this training, uh, Juan Torres Perez and Amber McCollum. So before we get started with today's content, I just want to go over some logistics information with you all. Uh, the series includes three two-hour sessions. Uh, the two remaining sessions after today will be held on the 23rd and the 30th at the same time and that's 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And recordings of each session um, of the series can be found on the training webpage uh, after those sessions are complete. So we've provided the link to the webpage here on the slide, um, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of this part, um, but we're, if we're not able to go over every question or we're not able to get to your question, um, please feel free to contact us via email here um, at the addresses we've provided on the slide. So as I mentioned, this series includes three sessions, um, with each focusing on the use of Google Earth Engine as a platform for land monitoring applications. Um, and just as a heads up, you'll likely refer to me, uh, refer, hear me refer to Google Earth Engine as GEE throughout this series. Um, and in session two, we'll go over methods of completing a supervised land cover classification uh, to identify cover types like forests, shrubs, and bare soil. Um, and we'll also complete an accuracy assessment of uh, to evaluate the performance of our classification. And in part three, we'll calculate a number of indices to assess environmental parameters over a time series and use this time series to detect land surface change. But before we get into these more involved topics, um, we're going to be going over the basics of GEE and some general land monitoring applications for today's session. And I mentioned our names earlier, but here are some pictures um, of the RSAT Eco team just so you can put faces to names. I also wanted to remind you all that you'll need a Google Earth Engine account to participate in our activities. Um, if you haven't already made one, um, make sure you go to the link listed here, um, which can also be found on the training webpage uh, to sign up for an account. Uh, Google Earth Engine accounts are free and you don't need to have a Gmail in order to sign up for one. Uh, they do, however, recommend that you use your uh, work or institutional email. Um, and you can also just search Google Earth Engine account sign up uh, in your browser to find this link. So hopefully you saw the instructions to sign up uh, for this account ahead of time, but if not, uh, really don't worry about it. Um, you can kind of just follow along with the activity on screen since I'm gonna be mirroring the code editor um, as we go through the code. Um, but make sure to sign up for that account as soon as possible. Um, and after the training, you can always go through the code that we talk about kind of line by line for your own understanding um, uh, without any of the instructors being on the line. All right, so here's a quick overview of what we'll be doing today. First, I'll go through some slides, uh, highlighting the potential benefits of using a cloud computing platform like Google Earth Engine for remote sensing. Um, and we'll go over some data products from land monitoring satellites, satellite sensors uh, available within GEE, and a number of examples showing the use of this data in Google Earth Engine for land management. Um, then we'll transition to the GEE code editor for our JavaScript API activity. Uh, where we'll take a closer look at the interface, uh, load Landsat 8 imagery, and calculate vegetation indices. And after this, we'll take a quick peek at the Google CoLab uh, platform to briefly look at the Python API option um, for working in GEE. And I just want to quickly remind you all that this will be a basic intro. So if you're a little more advanced with Google Earth Engine, we might be going over some things that you already know. Um, but this session is really to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, with the basics of the platform. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our first section uh, discussing GEE functionalities and available data types. So you might have already heard some of the buzz surrounding cloud-based raster computing uh, for remote sensing analysis. Um, but computing in a cloud has a variety of potential benefits. Uh, since you're not limited by your own personal computing capabilities, uh, you might be able to process larger data sets simultaneously or reduce the time it typically takes to process data. Uh, cloud re resources can also typically host and store more data. And since the cloud can be accessed from anywhere, these large stores of imagery and other data types are accessible from anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. Uh, with particular reference to Google Earth Engine, 
Uh, the barrier of cost is also removed for scientists, researchers, and developers, uh, since the platform is freely available to these user groups. So the GEE platform leverages the advantages of cloud computing to provide users with a single place for accessing satellite data, applying remote sensing methodologies, and displaying analysis results. Google's access to data storage and computing infrastructure uh, really allow the platform to host large remote sensing data sets and provide access to global imagery archives. And particularly relevant to our interest in GEE for this training series um, is the Application Programming Interface, or API, um, which can allow users to easily apply algorithms to complete things like land cover monitoring. So the GEE JavaScript API, and specifically the, the GEE code editor interface, um, is the most common method for interacting with GEE. Um, it's also the most frequently used by developers. Uh, so a lot of useful scripts and base code can be found online in the JavaScript API. Um, I know many of you may already have experience working with Python and are likely wondering if you can use Python rather than JavaScript. Um, and the short answer to this is yes. Uh, the Python API for GEE is available through the Google Co-Laboratory or Google Colab, um, and it can be a little more uh, difficult to use, and it's not quite as common. Um, so we'll be focusing more of our time on the JavaScript API, um, but we're going to take a really quick, um, brief look at Colab at the end of the session. And Google Colab essentially uses a specialized version of Jupyter Notebooks as an interface. Um, so if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you might be interested in using Colab for that reason as well. Um, and here on the screen, we have a, a screenshot of um, an example of visualizing a single map within the Colab interface. <clears throat> so a quick survey of some of the basic functionalities of Google Earth Engine. Uh, relevant for satellite imagery purposes includes things like automation of data processing and display, uh, near real-time monitoring, uh, machine learning algorithms, and the implementation of graphical user interfaces. Um, and these capabilities can assist with the processing of large data sets um, and the application of algorithms to multiple images um, over time series, um, as well as making results and data visualizations uh, a little bit more accessible. So you'll also note that many of these functions um, are common in more traditional GIS platforms like ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, so it's important to note that a lot of these uh, functions that you're currently using in a desktop GIS platform uh, are likely also available in Google Earth Engine. And here on the slide, we have a screenshot of the GEE code editor interface uh, displaying a classification and regression tree or CART classifier um, implemented over the San Francisco Bay Area using Landsat 8 imagery to complete a really simple uh, land cover classification uh, delineating urban, forest, and water cover types. Uh, just to give you a really quick example of what this kind of all looks like. So as I just alluded to in the previous slide, um, GE has a lot of potential for land monitoring applications. Um, and that's applications like long-term monitoring of landscape change, uh, computation of relevant indices, evaluating parameters like vegetation, soil, snow cover, um, and time series and change detection analysis of land surface features. So GEE also includes functionalities for calculating summary statistics, uh, validation and accuracy assessment, and the visualization and presentation of results. And the, the Earth Engine developers have really tried to make the platform as robust as other GIS platforms for processing, analyzing, um, and displaying the satellite data. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the relevant satellite data products that are hosted and available in Google Earth Engine. Uh, the first and potentially most extensive is the Landsat series uh, with data from all successful Landsat missions. Uh, the total series covers um, from 1972 to present day. And with data from Landsat 4 through 8, uh, there's also 30 meter spatial resolution data available from 1982 onward. And this includes raw images, uh, top of atmosphere reflectance, and surface reflectance data products. So these products are typically separated into tiers, uh, with tier one representing the highest quality images, um, with the least cloud cover typically. Um, however, the tier two images in these data sets are still good, um, but they have higher cloud cover and a little bit more atmospheric influence. So using tier one images, 
um, can help to reduce the need for cloud masking or filtering within your analysis, um, since they've already been selected for their high quality, uh, but all images should be filtered for cloud cover and potentially masked as well to improve your results. So on this slide and in the next few slides, I've provided uh, the Earth Engine data catalog link for your reference, uh, so you can take a closer look at the available data products that we're going over. So Sentinel-2 data is also available through GEE and includes top of atmosphere and surface reflectance products. Uh, the applications of Sentinel-2 data are pretty similar to Landsat, um, but there's a few notable differences that you're likely already aware of. Uh, Sentinel-2 has a higher spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters, um, a five-day revisit, um, but it also has an overall lower temporal coverage as the data doesn't start until 2015. So Sentinel-2 is often used in conjunction with Landsat-8 data, uh, to provide an overall higher temporal resolution um, and its higher spatial resolution is also um, frequently helpful for finer differentiation of land cover types or or smaller scale features of the land surface so GEE also contains the modus archive uh, you're likely already familiar with modus in some capacity uh, but as a reminder modus data spans from 2000 to present day and it's pretty popular due to its high temporal resolution uh, with a daily revisit time. And in terms of reflectance products, um, I would say two of the most valuable for, computing, for completing your own uh, land cover monitoring tasks um, are the daily and eight day global 250 meter surface reflectance products. Um, the eight day product composites the highest quality pixels over an eight day period, um, which means this product might be particularly useful if your study area is in a place that frequently experiences cloud cover. Um, it, and this surface reflectance data has similar capabilities to that of Landsat, um, but the reduced spatial resolution um, and spectral resolution um, can be challenging for some study areas and purposes. And here on the slide, I've displayed an example of the daily global MODIS surface reflectance product um, in the GE map. Um, and there are also a variety of pre-processed MODIS products that you might find useful, um, such as snow cover, vegetation indices, um, and uh, land cover data product type as well. So another data set you might find useful is uh, Sentinel-1 SAR. And this data is pre-processed and ready for use in Google Earth Engine. Um, we're gonna be focusing mostly on optical imagery for this series, uh, but I wanna make sure this radar data source uh, was included in the presentation. Um, SAR data is especially useful for vegetation mapping. Um, and if you'd like to engage a little bit further with this type of data in GEE, um, I really recommend checking out our forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data training. Uh, this training goes through a variety of exercises uh, to show you how to manipulate SAR data from a couple of different sensors um, in the Google Earth Engine platform. And you can find it here on the link that I've provided. You can also just go to the RSET website um, and search for this training as well. So I briefly mentioned this on the MODIS slide, uh, but there are also a variety of processed land cover layers available in Google Earth Engine. Um, I've shown an example of one here on the right. Uh, this is the data from uh, the Copernicus uh, Global Land Cover Layer data set. Um, and there are also layers displaying uh, the MODIS land cover data type product, um, maps of forest versus non-forest area derived from PALSAR data, um, and access to the USGS National Land Cover Database layers. Um, so make sure you take a look at these data catalog links um, to really get a full survey of uh, the available data layers and imagery archives. All right, so that was our super quick survey of relevant data products available. Um, and now I just wanna go over some applications for land monitoring related tasks. Um, so hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea uh, about the versatility of Google Earth Engine um, and resources that might be helpful for your own work. So first I wanna to touch on something that I actually previously covered um, in our FIRE series uh, that just wrapped up at the end of May. Um, but there is a tutorial and script for mapping burn severity in Google Earth Engine uh, made available by the UN Space-Based Information uh, for Disasters Management and Emergency Response Program, otherwise referred to as UN Spider. And this script uses either Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2 imagery to calculate the normalized burn ratio for pre and post-fire images. Um, it differences the two to create a difference normalized burn ratio, 
um, and then thresholds the map and results uh, to create a burn severity map for your chosen location. And you can see here is a screenshot um, of, of this Google Earth Engine code uh, for Empedrado, Chile in February 2017 after a series of fires burned in the area. And so if burn severity is part of your land monitoring efforts, definitely check out this training. Um, it can be a really nice resource to use if you're waiting on burn severity products. Um, say you're waiting on the monitoring trends in burn severity program um, to go ahead and release maps of burn severity. Um, you might not necessarily have to do that if you can use something like this to complete your own burn severity mapping. So another demonstrated application of GEE is mangrove mapping. Our previous training titled Remote Sensing for Mangroves in Support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, goes into detail of how to map mangrove extent and display results in Google Earth Engine. And the training goes step by step through a random forest classification to create a time series of mangrove extent change and also details the process of creating apps, tools, and graphical user interfaces in GEE to better communicate and display results. So you can see an example of the outputs from this training here on the slide. Uh, displaying mangrove extent for 2000, 2010, and 2020. And note that the graphical user interface um, allows a user to point and click to see the results rather than having to edit the code themselves. So to learn more about this work in particular, uh, please visit the Data Explorer and Comparison apps created to display this work. Um, I've provided links on the slide uh, for you to take a look later after uh, the session is over. And I also just wanted to mention that there is a section of the forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data training um, that I mentioned a little bit earlier that goes over techniques in Google Earth Engine uh, to map mangroves using SAR data. So I also wanted to highlight a couple of NAS develop program projects uh, that utilize Google Earth Engine. Uh, DEVELOP is a NASA Applied Sciences Workforce Development Program, um, and it engages early career scientists in remote sensing projects uh, focused on applying Earth observations to environmental issues. Um, so if you're interested in this type of work, um, you might want to look into engaging with DEVELOP program. Uh, our first example was completed by the DEVELOP Massachusetts team uh, for Cumberland County, Maine. And public health officials and vector biologists at the Maine Medical Center were really interested in identifying lands uh, within the county that represent forest edge habitat. Uh, the, they target these habitats for vector-borne disease mitigation uh, since they represent a higher risk of tick human encounters um, and, thus, and thus exposure to illnesses like Lyme disease. So identifying areas of potentially high encounter risk can really allow them to target tick presence assessments um, and provide risk advisories to the public. So for this work um, in Google Earth Engine, the team completed a supervised land cover classification uh, for the county, um, identified borders between forested and developed cover types, um, and calculated uh, edge habitat kind of across all of those different land cover types. <clears throat> so here was the team's final result. Uh, the classes used were urban, forest, and cultivated, uh, which accounts for cover types like agriculture. Um, more classes were initially calculated um, in their analysis. Uh, but it was determined that the most important classes uh, were these three, um, since the focus of this part of the project was to identify forest urban edge habitat. And the map on the left displays these cover types, um, the edges of urban and forested areas, and the overlap between the two. And in the second map on the right, we see the mapping of forest urban edge habitat highlighted in blue. And ultimately, uh, the team was successfully able to identify edge habitat in transportation corridors, uh, the borders of cities and small municipalities, um, as well as near recreation areas. So our second develop example uh, used vegetation indices to examine forest decline over the past 20 years in the Visayan Islands in the Philippines. Um, and biodiversity conservation organizations uh, working in the Visayan Islands um, are really concerned about the impact of habitat degradation on endangered species. Um, and mapping of vegetation decline in the area is particularly important in terms of uh, habitat, habitat loss for two species of interest. And those are the Visayan warty pig and the Visayan spotted deer. 
Um, so in an effort to map changes in vegetation, uh, the Develop Georgia team used the Terra Modis archive um, in Google Earth Engine from 2000 to 2019 to map vegetation indices uh, that helped to identify areas with critical vegetation loss. So here are their results. Uh, they used the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and the Enhanced Vegetation Index, or EDI, um, in GEE to map vegetation change from 2000 to 2019. I mean, you probably recognize NDVI, which is a pretty classic index for mapping vegetation, uh, but the team also chose to compute the EVI since it tends to perform better in areas with dense vegetation. Um, so note that both these maps display change in their respective vegetation indices, uh, with the most vegetation decrease observed on the northern island. And ultimately, conservation managers can use this data to target their habitat restoration efforts um, and select prime locations for the reintroduction of uh, the Visayan warty pig and spotted deer. All right, so that concludes the first section of the session. Uh, now we'll go ahead and move on to our activity in the Java AP, uh, JavaScript API. Um, and I'll go ahead and switch over to my browser. Um, but before that, I just wanted to highlight the link here on the slide. Um, this is the link that you can use to get to a snapshot of the code that we're gonna be using. Um, so you don't have to do any of the coding yourself. Um, you'll have it all there once you click this link. Um, and I think someone's gonna also be putting that into the chat as well. So you should have it from a couple different locations. And just as a reminder, if you don't have a Google Earth Engine account at this point, um, it's totally fine. Um, definitely make one as soon as you can, but for this activity, um, you can just follow along on screen. I'm gonna be mirroring my screen, showing all the code, um, and then you can go over any, any code after the session as well on your own. So we'll go ahead and switch over to my browser. Okay, so before we take a look at our JavaScript activity, I wanted to just quickly show you this Earth Engine data catalog website that we linked so much to um, within the slides. Um, you can look at different data sets um, and categories here. Um, there's climate and weather, um, imagery, um, which is a lot of what we talked about within um, our session, um, and then some of these other pre-processed uh, land cover products, cropland products, uh, things like that. Um, but for what we discussed mostly today, I just want to point you to um, the tabs up here. So for example, we have Landsat. And so that just shows us all of the data that's available from the Landsat series um, <clears throat> over the course of uh, the years. Uh, that's Landsats one through, one through eight. Um, and just as I mentioned, for example, in Landsat eight, you can take a look at how the data is processed, what data products are available. Um, we're gonna be using a surface reflectance product for um, our JavaScript activity. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, there's other data products available too um, through MODIS, uh, Sentinel as well. Um, and that provides Sentinel-1 SAR data um, as well as Sentinel-2 uh, optical data. So just to give you a quick look at the Earth Engine data cat catalog, um, but we'll go ahead and move on over to the GEE code editor. So hopefully you were able to uh, get your hands on the link so that we can um, follow, so that you can follow along with me um, as I go through this code. Um, but first, I want to give you a quick um, kind of overview of how the code editor works. Um, what are the different elements of the interface? Uh, things like that. So you'll notice things are divided here uh, in a similar way that something like um, our statistical software or our studio is organized. Um, so you'll see the main code editing area here, right in the middle, um, the GEE map uh, right below, which is where you can visualize your results, visualize the imagery that you're using, things like that. Um, over here, um, we have basically the, the file structure for organizing scripts. Um, so for example, we'll look here. Um, I have a repository that has some of the scripts that I've been using, including one here. Um, which is for our GE land monitoring sessions. Um, and I have the code nested here for part one. You'll also note the, the docs tab, this is really helpful. So if there's a function that you see within code or something um, that you're, you're not really sure what it means within the code, you can always just search it here 
um, it will give you information about what each command means, what uh, the JavaScript API is potentially saying to you, uh, things like that. So it's a really good search resource if you're not really sure what code is saying. And then we also have a section here that displays the assets that are already uploaded. Um, these are just some shape files that I already have from some of the other work that I've been doing. Um, and basically within Google Earth Engine, you have the opportunity to upload assets that you can then use um, within the Google Earth Engine platform. So that's things like shape files for clipping. Um, you can even upload your own imagery. Say the Google Earth Engine platform doesn't host something that you really wanna use. Um, you can upload that here in the assets. Um, so that you can work with it in GEE. And we'll take another look over here to the to the right of the screen. Um, you have the console. This is basically just where anything that you print goes. Um, we're going to use this a little bit to look at some of the, the metadata um, for the imagery that we're using. Um, the inspector um, allows you to click through some of the layers that you have displayed on the map to see um, pixel information or layer information, uh, depending on what you've already um, included within uh, the map frame. And then it also has a tab for tasks, so you can take a look at what uh, Google Earth Engine is running through your account um, at the moment. Awesome, so we're gonna move over to the code editor. And, and how we're gonna do this is, um, you'll notice uh, all the code is currently commented out. Um, as we go through the code, um, what you're gonna wanna do is uh, uncomment things as I uncomment them. Um, the two slashes um, basically signals the code editor to uh, comment out the code. Um, so we'll go ahead and delete these two slashes, um, which kind of activates the code, um, makes it ready for processing and ready to run within the code editor. Um, and you'll also notice uh, just descriptions above um, laying out what each command is doing or what each uh, section of the code is, is doing within uh, the full series of the code. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we wanna do is establish kind of a spatial extent for our analysis. So we're gonna be using Landsat 8 imagery, but we have to tell Google Earth Engine uh, where exactly that Google Earth imagery, imagery is going to be covering. Um, so in this case, uh, we establish a variable, which is point. And so that point variable is going to signal to Google Earth Engine um, what our spatial extent is, uh, what Landsat imagery um, we're filtering for. And so the function here for uh, geometry point um, basically just establishes our point of interest as uh, this lat long value, um, which in this case is the, the Bay Area, just to filter our data um, spatially um, for the study area that we're working with. And so the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is import a uh, Landsat 8 surface reflectance data. Um, and so that comes in an image collection, basically a series um, of all the Landsat 8 surface reflectance images um, that we're gonna need to end up filtering. And so we establish the variable here as L8, basically just standing for Landsat 8. And then we're calling the image collection um, with this command here, uh, ee.imageCollection, um, and then specifying um, basically the file structure of where that Landsat data is located. And to, go, to give you a little bit more context about how this works, um, whatever data you're interested in using with Google Earth Engine, um, you can type in here. So we're interested in Landsat 8 surface reflectance. Let's see, so we want surface reflectance tier one. So we can take a quick look at that. It'll go ahead and show us uh, some of the metadata about the, uh, about the imagery. Um, it'll provide us with information about how it was processed, um, what bands are available, um, this is a really great search function to, to learn more about the data that you're using. Um, and basically, where we get that command uh, to call this data into the code editor essentially is right here, and you can just go ahead and click and copy. Um, and you'll notice that this, uh, this highlighted copied section right here um, is identical to what we have here in the code. So that's one really easy way to kind of filter and search for imagery that you might be interested in using. Um, and then kind of just copy and paste it right into your code. And so now that we've established uh, the, the area that we're trying to do our analysis in, um, as well as uh, the image collection that we're working with, um, we can go ahead and uh, get some more specific filtering with the imagery. So we'll go ahead and uncomment this series. So we're trying to get a single image um, filtered for the Bay Area um, for the month of May. And we'll just 
go ahead and uncomment all of this code here. Awesome. So we're establishing another variable. It's a single image, the one that we would like to uh, process for a series of vegetation indices. Um, and as you can see here, um, we're calling that image and filtering uh, the image collection that we just called into the script. So to establish that image, uh, we're working from the L8 image collection, which we've just established up here. Um, and we're filtering bounds, uh, which essentially is like our spatial filter. So we're filtering that to the point that we've provided um, in the, the first line of active code. Um, we're filtering for a date, which is um, the least cloudy image within May. So we're looking at May 2021. Um, so images within that time frame. Um, and then we're sorting by cloud cover. Um, there's a, a cloud cover attribute to the data, um, which we can use to kind of filter for the least cloudy image. Um, and then here, where we're saying first, uh, that essentially is picking the first um, image uh, that fits all of this criteria and has the lowest cloud cover. And so with that, we want to just take a look and see what that image is. Um, so to view the selected image metadata, we'll just go ahead and use this, uh, this print command here or print function. And so what we're going to do right now is just go ahead and run this series of code that we have uncommented. And so this is calling in the image collection, filtering it um, for the point that we're interested in, the dates that we're interested in, as well as cloud cover. I mean, we can see here that that selects a single image. And you'll see here in the console, as we kind of click through, it will say 12 elements, um, which essentially equates to uh, one image, which let's see here. So you can see all of the bands associated with the image um, that we've called into the script. Um, you can see some additional metadata. Let me just blow this up a little bit so we can see this a little bit easier. Awesome, so you can see the cloud cover score as well. I and mean, let's see if we can find the date. I think it's just a little bit lower. All right. We have the the name of the image here, which basically shows us uh, at the end here, uh, the date itself. So we have the month of May, so that's the 05. Um, 08 is the day of the month, and then 2021. So this is filtered uh, all of the, the collection of Lanta 8 surface reflectance data for the month of May in 2021. I mean, it's given us that um, least cloud cover image um, so that we can go ahead and proceed with our uh, vegetation indices calculations. Cool. So now that we have uh, the image established uh, with the variable image, um, we're going to go ahead and start working with some of the bands that were available um, within that image. So as you saw, each of the bands was listed um, in the metadata of that image. I can bring that right back up. So we have um, bands 1 through 11, which each correspond to a different portion of the, the spectrum that we're interested in using for calculation. Um, and so we'll go ahead and uncomment this section of the code here. And so for our image, um, we're interested in reassigning some of the names of these bands. So that's a little bit easier to do our vegetation index calculation. So right here, basically what we're telling Google Earth Engine to do is select these three bands uh, within the image itself and then reassign them the names uh, near infrared, red, and blue um, so that we can go ahead and compute some of these different vegetation indices. So that establishes uh, basically how we're going to be calculating um, each of these, these indices. And it makes it a little bit easier for us to work with the data. Awesome, so the first vegetation index that we're gonna be calculating is one that you're, you're likely very familiar with. It's one that we always talk about. It's NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Um, I've shown here in line 23, um, basically how that's calculated. Um, it's basically just using the, the near infrared and red bands um, to assess greenness. So you can see that calculation here. I mean, and this calculation is so ubiquitous uh, that, or really any normalized difference calculation is so ubiquitous that uh, the Google Earth Engine developers have actually created um, a function for that. So you can see here, we'll go ahead and uncomment this. Um, NDVI essentially equals the image that we have uh, filtered 
Um, and then it calculates the normalized difference uh, with the near infrared as well as the red. Um, so that's basically just like a shortcut so that you don't have to do some of the more complex calculations within the code. Um, before this uh, function was established, um, you used to have to use this code up here, which we'll briefly uncomment, um, which is basically just coding in that equation of near infrared minus red uh, divided by near infrared plus red. But we're gonna go ahead and comment this out um, because we have that kind of shortcut function available for NDVI. And then we're gonna go ahead and display our NDVI results within uh, the GEE map section. So we're gonna uncomment these two pieces of code. And essentially this first one is just establishing uh, the visualization parameters um, that we wanna use for this map. Um, so basically what it's telling us is that uh, for each pixel, uh, the minimum value is a negative one, the maximum value is one, um, and then we use this palette to kind of score um, the values across that min and max. And so the function that you wanna use for adding a map uh, to uh, the map section of GEE code editor um, is map.addLayer. Um, and we're going to specify that we want to add the NDVI with our NDVI visualization parameters that were established in the previous line. And then we're going to want to name that layer uh, NDVI image. And so we'll go ahead and just run this. So it'll take us through all of the code. And then it's filtered uh, that single image from, from Landsat. And then it's applied the NDVI, applied the visualization parameters we've given it, and then it's added that map layer uh, to the map interface. We can take a quick look at it. Um, you'll see here layers are displayed um, here for you to click on and off. We can change the transparency of those. Um, so this is our NDVI layer. I'm really quickly just mapped um, within GEE so we can take a look. Um, but that's not where we're gonna finish things up. Um, we wanna compute a couple of other vegetation indices for comparison. So we'll go up back up here to the code editor. And the next uh, vegetation index that we're going to compute is the enhanced vegetation index, um, or EVI you might be familiar with. Um, so the equation for EVI is here. Um, it's also a function of uh, the near infrared and red, um, but also adding in the blue band as well as a few constants um, in there. And the, the EVI is typically used for denser vegetation areas. Um, so if you have a dense vegetation study area, sometimes the EVI is a little bit more accurate at detecting vegetation. And so we're gonna go about this in a little bit of a different way, because as you can see, that equation is a little bit more complicated. So let's go ahead and start by uncommenting these two lines. So we're gonna go ahead and establish our variable, which is EVI, which we're calculating, and then we're going to use uh, this expression function so that we can just go ahead and type out um, the equation that we're using to calculate EVI. So it, it mirrors pretty exactly this, uh, this equation here that we have commented out. Um, and that's just a much easier way of kind of visualizing your equation without having to do um, a lot of the more complica complicated math functions. And so when you create an expression like this, um, you have to define with what each of the uh, variables you've included means. Um, so here we're just defining what uh, near infrared means, what red means, and what blue means. And so you're gonna wanna go ahead and delete those slashes to, to activate the code. And you'll see here um, that we're kind of all ready to process um, for EBI. So essentially what this section of the code is doing here, it's just establishing within our image um, what each of these variables that we've coded into the expression means. Um, so we're just, letting it know that when we're saying NIR in our expression, that's just referring to the, to the NIR band um, that we've already established within the image. So this is all ready to calculate EVI. And we'll go ahead and do something similar that we did with the NDVI, which is just set our parameters for mapping the EVI. And um, then we'll do that same map.addLayer function, um, including the EVI parameters that we have for visualization, and then naming the layer EVI image. So we'll go ahead and run that one as well. Awesome, so this is just EVI uh, mapped over the same Landsat image. Um, and we can unclick just to show differences in how um, those different indices have evaluated vegetation. You'll notice that 
some areas are flagged that weren't flagged within NDVI as being higher vegetation. Um, you can also adjust the transparency here um, to take a look at how those two vegetation indices differ. I mean, we're basically just gonna do this one more time. So there are typically three uh, vegetation indices that come up when we talk about Landsat data. Um, we've already gone over two. The next is uh, the soil adjusted vegetation index. Um, and this index is really good for sparsely vegetated areas because it tries to correct for uh, bare soil surface or, or bare land surface um, to get a more accurate um, assessment of vegetation. So similar to the others, uh, we have the equation here of how we've done this. And you'll see it's also a function of the near infrared and red, um, but just with a different constant um, as well as uh, multiplied by another constant as well. So we'll go ahead and uncomment this section of the code. And you'll remember from the, the EVI calculation, this is just us establishing the variable of soil adjusted vegetation, uh, sorry, soil adjusted vegetation index, um, which is SAVI. Um, and we're employing another expression. In this case, um, we're calculating uh, with that equation for SAVI. And then we have to just establish what each of those variables means as it relates to the bands of the image that we're using. So we're just establishing here once again, uh, basically which band is near infrared and which band is red. And so with that, we're all ready to calculate soil adjusted vegetation index. And then we'll go ahead and just establish those same visualization parameters um, that we used for EDI and NDVI. Oops, we'll just delete those slashes again to uncomment the code. And then we'll use the map.addLayer function uh, to, to go ahead and add that map uh, to the Google Earth Engine map interface as well. Awesome, so we'll go ahead and run that. See it mapping NDVI, now EVI. Now we've got the soil adjusted vegetation index. And you can just ignore this line down here. That's just to center the map um, on the, the image that we're using. Um, but go ahead and ignore that. We're not going to uncomment it. Awesome. So you can see here we have the three layers of each of the vegetation indices we've calculated. Um, and as you'll note, like kind of as we click through them, each one does different assessments of vegetation, mostly the same, targeting the same areas that are more vegetated. Um, soil adjusted vegetation index for the Bay Area is looking a little bit more realistic just because uh, the, the vegetation within the Bay Area is a little bit more sparse itself, um, except for forested areas. So this just shows you an example of a way that you can use Google Earth Engine to compare indices, maybe figure out what your best, uh, your best methodology is for calculating uh, vegetation or uh, another index that you're interested in using. And one last thing that we're going to do is um, just look at mapping um, an index over a collection. So what we essentially did was call an image collection into Google Earth Engine and then pick out one image that was uh, our chosen image based off of our filtering parameters. So we chose an image that was in the month of May um, that had the least cloud cover. Um, and then we chose that image uh, to do our processing of, uh, of each of these vegetation indices. But when you're mapping over a collection, you can essentially take every image within that image collection over a number of dates and then apply that index uh, to the full uh, uh, collection of images that you filtered for in terms of date. So we'll take a really quick look here at how something like this might work. So we'll go ahead and uncomment the code. And this line of the code is just to establish uh, the indices that we're working with. So essentially, we're just calculating enhanced vegetation index all over again. A lot of this looks the same. Just keep uncommenting the code there so that we can use it. We'll just do, oops, we'll just do the whole thing. All right. So what we're doing essentially is a, a kind of truncated version of what we've done previously for, for one image. 
or we're just establishing what the function is um, with the variable indices. And we're essentially um, using the same parameters that we used assigning all of our bands, uh, names, near infrared, red, blue, uh, things like that if we wanted to compute more vegetation indices. And then we're establishing um, the enhanced vegetation index, which is the, the vegetation index that we're gonna use for this example. Um, establishing the expression of how we want the index to be calculated. Um, and then once again, um, calling in those bands uh, so that Google Earth Engine knows um, what to calculate. And we're going ahead and adding a band essentially for EVI to the entire image collection. Um, so we're, we're doing a rename of this function as uh, EVI um, and we're adding a band here um, that's EVI to each of the images within the image collection. And so now we're, we're gonna go ahead and establish a collection that's filtered to some of our own parameters. This is very similar to what we did um, at the beginning of the code just to filter for one image, um, but it's slightly different now. Awesome. So we're going ahead and establishing our variable of the collection, um, which is essentially right here, if you'll remember, the full image collection is L8. That's what we named it uh, toward the beginning of the code. And we're gonna filter bounds uh, to uh, point, uh, which is essentially the same ge geometric point that we use to, to filter for the single um, tile of Landsat imagery. And so we're gonna filter the date a little bit differently. We're gonna go for all images um, in 2021 from January to the end of May. And then for the purposes of, of this really quick uh, intro to applying an index over an image collection, um, we're just gonna go ahead and uh, filter for cloud cover. So essentially what this is saying is we wanna filter uh, the, for metadata, specifically the, the cloud cover land, um, and we want less than 20. So that's essentially um, that, that standard that you might've heard before that we only wanna be working with imagery that has less than 20% uh, cloud cover. So we're filtering for cloud cover that way. Um, Typically you would do some, some cloud masking and we'll show examples of that a little bit later on in the series, but this is just a, a quick way to do some, some filtering for cloud cover. And then we're also sorting each of those images in terms of their cloud cover. So uh, lowest cloud cover first, um, and then we're calling that index that we established here um, with the variable indices um, right here to the map. So really quickly, we're gonna go ahead and just run the code once more after uncommenting this print function. And so you'll see this is the initial image that we, we picked out to do um, our calculation of NDVI, EVI, and SAVI. Um, and then here we have the image collection that we've just established um, for January to May in 2021. And so you'll see there's seven elements here. So we have seven Landsat images within our collection as we filtered it. Um, so that's seven images that um, were scored for less than 20% cloud cover um, within our date range as well as our spatial coverage of the Bay Area. And so we're going to do something really simple now, um, which is essentially just add this layer uh, to the map. So we still have the, the EVI parameters established from earlier in the code. So we're basically just going to be mapping the EVI band um, with the EVI parameters that we established earlier um, and then naming that the EVI collection image. So we'll go ahead and run that. This isn't necessarily standard practice, but I just wanted to show you um, a really simple example of, of mapping one of these indices over um, an entire image collection. So we'll go ahead and untick some of these. So the EVI collection image is essentially um, a, a reduced mean of all of those seven images um, that we established within the collection. So this is basically an averaged image of all the EVIs over the course of those seven images, um, which is something that that I think you would typically want to do uh, seasonally or at some aggregate that's informative for you. 
Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing this type of, of averaging between different uh, dates, you probably want to be doing some cloud masking as well, but we just wanted to show you this really quick example of how that's done. So that finishes the code that we were planning to go over today. Um, and you'll see here we have four different layers. Um, we calculated uh, three different vegetation indices um, for one Landsat 8 surface reflectance image. And then we also applied an enhanced vegetation index over an image collection of seven images uh, within Google Earth Engine. So I hope that was a good uh, first kind of glance at Google Earth Engine. If you're not necessarily familiar with uh, coding or with JavaScript, obviously, um, it might have been a little bit confusing, but definitely take the time to kind of go through some of these uh, activities and exercises after uh, the session's over so that you can get a little bit better of a handle of how this all works. Um, and obviously today was kind of like our brief intro to that. So uh, definitely take a little bit more time with the code and we'll be going, be going over things a little bit more extensively in the following sessions. All right, so next up, uh, now that we've taken a peek at the JavaScript API, let's take a quick look at uh, the Python API um, for all you really dedicated Python users out there. Um, and we'll go ahead and switch over to Google Colab. Awesome, so here I have uh, the Earth Engine Python API Colab setup main page. Um, we're gonna be going over this really, really briefly. We're not gonna be doing anything too extensive or intense. Um, with the Python API and Colab. Um, I just want to make sure that you all kind of have exposure to what this looks like, uh, to what the interface in, in Colab looks like if you're interested in engaging um, with the Python API. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, we're not really going to be focusing, focusing on the Python API quite as much uh, or really at all after, after this session. We just wanted to make sure you get this quick demo um, to take a look at it. Awesome. So here on the main page of the setup, um, they're going to walk you through uh, some steps of getting started with Colab. Um, you'll notice everything looks very Google Drive. Um, I've taken a lot of these instructions and commands um, and functions um, and moved them over to a different uh, notebook within Colab. Um, but this is a good step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to set up Colab, um, how to start doing some initial map visualization, sorry, visual Oh my God, sorry, visualizations um, of a static image, um, an interactive map. Um, and then also I think there is a chart visualization as well, which is nice. Um, so I'm gonna show you what some of this looks like. Um, essentially what I did was um, I looked at the setup page. Um, I just went ahead and started a new notebook um, for myself to, to work with some of this code. And if you'll remember when we were first talking about uh, Colab, it's essentially a specialized version of Jupyter Notebooks. So if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, this is going to look um, very similar to you. Um, and it's going to function as, as, a, as the same interface, essentially, um, in Google Earth Engine, but working with Python. So hopefully that'll reconnect me. Awesome. So this is essentially the, the Colab Notebook interface that we're going to be um, just really quickly demoing with Earth Engine. Um, the first thing that you have to do is import Earth Engine into Colab. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and run that code. You do that with a quick hit to this play button here. So that'll import Earth Engine for your initial setup. And then this is a, a part that I've already done um, within the, the code to go ahead and authorize and uh, authenticate on the running of Google Earth Engine in my Google Colab notebook. Um, so You'll be walked through this step if you decide to complete that for yourself. Um, but I wanted to go ahead and get to some of the Python code that was used to interact with um, Google Earth Engine. So you'll see here's just a really quick example of uh, printing the elevation of Mount Everest. So those of you more familiar with Google Earth, en sorry, with Python will recognize some of these uh, functions or commands um, that you might be interested in using to, to interface with Earth Engine. Um, and in this first example, you're essentially just printing uh, the Mount Everest elevation just as a test to make sure that um, the import and authentication went well and that you can run Google Earth Engine um, in your Python API uh, Colab notebook. So you'll see here, it's basically just calling an image from uh, 
USGS SRTM, um, that's the Shuttle Radar sorry, Topography Mission, um, which is especially helpful for getting elevation data. They've established a geometry point here um, and then defined uh, basically what the meaning of elevation is in, in the context of this code and then just printed out that elevation, um, which in this case is 8,729 meters. And so we'll move on to the next section of example code. Um, and this is uh, just the import image function, um, basically just to display a map, a uh, single static map. And we'll go ahead and play that. And you'll notice that within this uh, notebook interface, um, your code's gonna be up here and then a separate cell is going to populate with whatever map visualization you're completing with whatever chart visualization you're doing, um, things like that. So essentially, um, calling in the image, um, visualizing it based off of this set of parameters um, in Python within your notebook. We've got a little bit longer of a script here. Um, and this is to import a, a map that you're able to navigate, I believe. Let's see, hopefully that works. Let's try it again. There we go. And so this basically just imports an interactive map. Um, this is all SRTM data, it's elevation. And you'll see this is a global data set of topography. And so in this case, we're looking at elevation. You'll notice that in the United States, I see you have the Rocky Mountains at some higher elevations. Um, basically just for your reference with the elevation. And we'll, we'll look a little closer at this. But essentially what you're doing is just defining um, visualization parameters, the object that you're working with, which is the elevation established from the SRTM earlier in the code. Um, and then you're selecting for the navigable map and then working through some of the visualization parameters with elevation and then displaying the map itself within, uh, within your CoLab notebook. So as I mentioned, we're not really gonna be going too much further into this. This was just to give you a really, really quick, brief intro um, to what this looks like. Um, as I said, if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, maybe this is gonna be a preferred method of engaging with Earth Engine for you. Um, but for our purposes, um, we're a little bit more familiar with uh, the JavaScript API, um, and we tend to suggest using it just because so much of the development going on with Google Earth Engine is happening in that GEE code editor, which uses JavaScript. Um, so sometimes it can be just a little bit easier to find um, base code, scripts, things like that um, when you're using the JavaScript API as opposed to Python. However, um, obviously Python is a really popular way of engaging with remote sensing data. Um, a lot of people are already familiar with it. So I think you can expect um, things like Colab, the Python API to become more and more popular with the Earth Engine um, and more development to continue happening um, with notebooks like this. So. I hope we didn't disappoint you by only going into that in kind of the most surface level way possible, um, but we just wanted to let you know uh, what was available for the Python API and kind of what it looks like, how you can navigate it, um, and what the platform itself uh, can do for you in general. And so that wraps up our final demo um, of the Python API. All right, so that concludes our first session in the GEE land monitoring series. Um, Here's some major takeaways from this part. Uh, GEE's cloud-based environment can remove barriers to engaging with remote sensing data, uh, barriers like data storage and personal computing power. Um, and it's important to note that the functionalities of GEE are similar to many GIS uh, desktop platforms uh, used to do things like create land classifications and calculate environmental parameters uh, from satellite data. And GEE also hosts many relevant land monitoring data sets uh, from sensors like Landsat, MODIS, uh, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-1-SAR. And in our activity, you saw the capabilities of the JavaScript API to complete basic functions like imagery filtering and uh, vegetation index calculation. And we also briefly explored the Python API uh, housed in Google Colab. And please make sure you join us next week for our session on land cover classification and accuracy assessment.
So here's our contact info again, uh, just in case you have any questions about today's session um, that we're not able to cover in the Q&A. And we've also provided links to the training page, uh, the RSET website, and to our social media. Um, and we encourage you all to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. So thank you all so much for joining today. Um, and I want to give a special thank you to John Dilger from the Spatial Informatics Group, um, who helped us out with the JavaScript API activity. Um, and we'll go ahead and switch over to our Q&A session. All right, so it looks like we already have the Q&A doc up. Awesome. So before we jump right into as many questions as we can kind of get through in the next hour, um, I just wanted to give you another quick reminder. Um, if you weren't able to follow along with the uh, JavaScript activity today, um, because you don't have a Google Earth Engine account, um, definitely make sure to get one of those um, so that you can be following along with the code um, for the next couple of sessions. Um, if it's not something that you want to do, if you just want to follow along on screen, that's also fine. Um, but we kind of encourage you to engage a little bit more with the code that way um, and follow along with us in your own uh, JavaScript interface. Awesome. So it looks like we'll just go ahead and start with question one. So let's see, does GEE charge for commercial use? What are the costs? Are there additional features? So I believe that GEE is not officially available for commercial use at this point. Um, this is likely going to change, and private commercial organizations may end up being charged for the use of GEE. Um, however, all available features of GEE are available through the free accounts, um, and you can usually contact the developers if you need more space allotted to your account. Um, so basically what this means is that I think the intention at some point in the future is to charge uh, private commercial organizations for the use of Google Earth Engine, um, but that doesn't really affect uh, scientists, researchers, um, students, uh, nonprofits from engaging with uh, Google Earth Engine and using its full functionalities for their own purposes. Um, and then this comment here about um, contacting the, the GE developers just to get a little bit more uh, space allotted to your account. And um, it's something that um, I have a couple of colleagues who've needed to do. They they said, I need a little bit more space. They'll give them a rough estimate um, anywhere from like 50 gigabytes to, to 300 gigabytes, kind of whatever they think their needs are. And usually, um, uh, the kind developers at Google Earth Engine are able um, to allot for at least some of that space. Um, and I think at some point in the future, maybe uh, huge amounts of, of storage might end up being something that you're charged for. But I would say that's probably not something that you would encounter if you're if you're using Google Earth Engine for say like a 50 gig, uh, sorry, 500 gigabyte capacity, something like that. Awesome. So question two. What is the time lag from the time an image is collected by the satellites to the time it is made available in the GEE data catalog? I'm asking this question because I'm thinking of using GEE uh, for real-time vegetation condition monitoring, uh, where I would want to create a GEE app. Uh, so the processed imagery, uh, like the Landsat Surface Reflectance product, should be available within a few days of imagery capture. I mean, it kind of depends on the particular product, but I, I believe the standard is no later than three to four days after the imagery is released um, by the organization that distributes the data. Um, that organization is usually um, NASA or ESA if you're using Sentinel data, uh, something like that. So I think the intention within Google Earth Engine is to provide as many um, near real-time uh, monitoring products as possible. So basically what that means is they'll try to make that data available kind of as soon after as possible um, that it's made available to them. And I believe they have kind of a variety of processing pipelines. So a lot of this is automated so that whenever that data product is available, um, it will be uploaded to the Google Earth Engine data catalog so that you'll have it available. Um, and another thing that you can do with um, image filtering, just to keep in mind within the code, is you can essentially set the parameter to a start date and then you can say like up to present. So you don't necessarily even have to edit your own code um, to account for additional images. Um, and it, you could basically just ask the code uh, to process all the images leading up to uh, present day as well as present day. And if you're most interested in that, in that current image, you can also just say um, the most recent image is what you would like to process. So I think that something like Google Earth Engine would probably work well um, for a near real-time vegetation condition monitoring app. All right, question three. 
can we create shapefiles using GEE? If yes, can you please show a demonstration? Um, so I think for this question, so we're not jumping too much back and forth between the Q&A doc um, and the interface, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just direct you to some of the exporting resources available through the developers. Um, and basically the short answer is that you can create shapefiles using Google Earth Engine. Um, and normally the way that you would create this is uh, by using um, a geometry in the interface. Uh, and typically that's you creating a polygon, maybe establishing a set of points, establishing a, a rectangle that you would like to be your shape file. Um, and you can make that a feature collection and then export uh, that as a shape file using the export table function. Um, so definitely follow that link right here um, to learn a little bit more about how to do this. Um, I believe it's a relatively simple process. Uh, we typically um, get our shape files from say uh, county or national organizations and then we end up uploading those actually to Google Earth Engine as an asset. Um, but you should be able to export um, any of the geometries that you create in Google Earth Engine as a shape file. And question four, is there integration between GEE and GitHub? So I'm not sure about direct integration between GEE and GitHub, um, but there is an active group of GEE developers on GitHub uh, with a variety of scripts and tools available that you might find interesting. I'm gonna link to a repository here. Um, I've also seen uh, quite a bit of Google Earth Engine code hosted on GitHub's, uh, sorry, hosted on GitHub repositories, um, kind of on an organization by organizational basis. Um, for example, a lot, of, a lot of academic labs working with Google Earth Engine will have their own GitHub page where they just host all of their Google Earth Engine code. Um, and that kind of helps them push and pull between um, various researchers within the lab. But it's not necessarily something that I think you'll be able to access through like, say the JavaScript API. Great. Question five. What are the limitations of uh, the JavaScript codes using GE over Python in functionality? So uh, essentially JavaScript is uh, currently the primary API for engaging with Google Earth Engine. Um, so while I don't really believe that there's any uh, real differences in potential functionality of the APIs, uh, the current GEE developer community tends to favor the JavaScript API, which basically just means that there are usually more available scripts, trainings, uh, tutorials, and tools um, available using the JavaScript API. So you'll probably find that um, some of the scripts that are available for the things that you want to do, any trainings that you might want to take are, are typically happening in the JavaScript API. Um, and the Python API also requires um, an intermediate platform like Colab, rather than the direct engagement possible with the JavaScript code editor. Um, and so basically that's kind of your decision to make um, based off your preference, whether or not you'd prefer kind of a, a notebooks interface uh, with the Python API and Colab or um, direct access to Google Earth Engine using the JavaScript API. So question six, can you please explain the difference between top of atmosphere and surface reflectance data sets of Landsat and Sentinel? Which data set is recommended for applying image, image classifications and indices? So essentially, uh, top of atmosphere data doesn't complete an atmospheric correction to eliminate the influences of the atmosphere. Um, it does a radiance correction. It does some simple uh, geometric uh, corrections as well. Um, but it's not really accounting for the full effect of, of the atmosphere within the data. Um, whereas surface reflectance data does complete this correction. Uh, so the reflectance data is more representative of the reflectance of light directly uh, from the surface of the earth um, back up to the sensor itself. And we typically recommend using surface reflectance products uh, since they account for the influences of the atmosphere. Um, so, so in short, I guess our recommendation of between the two types of data would be going for surface reflectance if that's something that's available to you. Um, and in the case of Landsat and Sentinel, um, you do have access to those surface reflectance products. Um, and we would typically recommend that you use those, especially for land applications.
All right, question seven. Can we change the coordinate reference system in Google Earth Engine? Uh, so GEE is designed to take into account the projection of data on a product by product basis, um, which essentially means that you shouldn't have to worry too much about the coordinate reference system um, between each of your data sets because Google Earth Engine will attempt to account for those I mean, in any calculations that you make. Um, but if you'd like to change the coordinate reference um, and the projection of, of your data within the JavaScript API, um, I've provided a link here that shows a little bit about how to do this. Um, and hopefully that kind of points you in the right direction with any questions you might have about the coordinate reference system in Google Earth Engine. And question eight, can shapefiles generated by the user from platforms such as ArcGIS or QGIS be used for information queries? So yes, uh, these shapefiles will just need to be uploaded um, as uh, assets in Google Earth Engine. So basically what this means is that you can take um, really any shapefile that you're interested in using, um, whether it's produced in ArcGIS, sorry, ArcGIS, QGIS, um, or any other GIS platform, as long as it's a shapefile, and you can upload that to Google Earth Engine um, as an asset, and you'll have full access to that asset once it's kind of uploaded into Google Earth Engine, um, and you'll be able to do uh, queries of different data products, um, imagery, um, using that asset as a feature collection. And we're actually going to show an example of this in uh, the next session with land classification. We'll be showing um, an uploaded shapefile asset that's a county boundary, um, and we'll be making that a feature collection, uh, essentially, so that we can map a, a composited Landsat image just over the bounds of that shapefile. So that's actually a really good um, question about doing some spatial filtering when you're working with imagery as well. Okay, question nine. Can I perform data fusion for multi-sensor, I guess multi-sensor data in Google Earth Engine? So the short answer to this is yes. I mean, I think there's a, quite a variety of ways to do this depending on your data inputs. Um, but it's a little beyond the scope of the session. Um, and after uh, we conclude the session, I'll try to look for some more information about potential um, standard operating procedures or ways that this is done in the past. And I'll, I'll try to link you to those. So definitely take a look back at um, this Q&A doc after the session's over. And I think that's that's an important thing to note as well. You'll you'll notice that the the Q and A doc as it looks now um, won't necessarily look the same once you're looking at the PDF of it on the website, um, because we try to add some of these little extra information points in there to to fully answer your questions. All right, question ten. Can I integrate the GEE app, uh, sorry API, with some web application to display the results? Um, so you have. Um, a couple of options here. Um, you can display the results directly in the map section of the JavaScript API, um, and you can even code a graphical user interface so that the user just has to run the code um, in the code editor, and then they can just kind of point and click their way through the rest of uh, the results um, using um, the code generated user interface um, that will pop up in the map section of the, the JavaScript API. And you might also choose to develop a GE app. Um, which I believe can be embedded on web pages to make them a little more accessible. Um, and you'll notice back in the slides where we were talking about some of the mangrove work going on with Google Earth Engine, there are links to two Google Earth Engine apps um, on that slide that you might wanna take a look at. Um, so when you create a Google Earth Engine app, it's a really kind of nice, clean experience where really all the user has to do is plug in a URL, um, and it essentially just shows the app uh, within your browser so that you can navigate through any data results. Um, I think some of them give you the option as well to do some of your own processing if you'd like to either filter that by a certain boundary, whether that be like a shape file or a point, um, or do some of your own calculations based on averaging between years. And um, there's kind of a lot of different opportunities to, to utilize the full functionality of uh, the GEE API, um, but through a more accessible um, platform like an application that that say the user only has to point and click through. So it's a great way to display results and then also do some generation of 
uh, results that the user is most specifically interested in, and they can even be used as a way to kind of distribute data products as well. Okay, question 11. Does the code editor allow for collaborative editing, i.e. can it be shared amongst different users and track changes? So the short answer to your general question is yes. Um, the code editor allows you to share um, snapshots of code um, like we've done today. Um, you'll notice you just had to click on the link and it kind of took you directly to the code in the JavaScript API. Um, but you can also uh, share the, the file itself of the code so that multiple editors can change the same script. Um, however, this editing can't be done simultaneously. I think you can do some version control just to make sure you're not losing anything or you can see what updates were made by a different editor. Um, but it's not quite the same as say on a Google Doc where you can have multiple editors at the same time. So if you're collaboratively, collaboratively working with someone on code, you might wanna just make sure that you're working on that at two different distinct times so that you're not kind of saving over each other. Um, and as I said, I think you can kind of manage that with, with versions to make sure that you're not losing anything. It's just important to note that that editing isn't gonna happen um, simultaneously within the same script file. Awesome. So question 12, we can upload our own data. Interesting. How much data? Uh, how do we upload it? Are there proprietary constraints? Um, is there a space limitation for upload? And can we also upload external spatial data that is not imagery and use it for modeling in GEE like uh, TIFF or grid files? Um, so these are all great questions um, that kind of get at the root of uh, working with external data sources in Google Earth Engine. And that's basically just any data source that isn't coming from the Google Earth Engine data catalog um, and isn't already kind of preloaded and available within the, the GEE um, API. So the, the really short answer to, <laughs> to a variety of your questions here um, is yes, you can upload your own imagery and other data sources as assets in the GEE platform. Um, I, I don't believe that there are any proprietary constraints um, since you can keep your assets private. Um, so that kind of gets at the proprietary constraints question that you asked. I um, mean, basically what this means is that if you're uploading an asset, um, once you upload that asset, um, it will be kept private, private to your Google Earth Engine account. You can choose who you'd like to share that asset with, um, or you can just make the asset public um, so that anyone can use it kind of with, uh, uh, basically a directory section of the code referencing um, that asset within your own repository. And so your question, is there a space limitation for upload? Um, so space is uh, currently limited per account, um, but as I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, I think you can usually contact the Google Earth Engine developers to ask for additional space. Um, and they prefer to do that on kind of a case-by-case -case basis um, with an estimate of how about how much data you would need. Um, so if you're uploading a huge record of, of imagery, that's definitely something that would warrant a bigger ask in terms of data storage available in Google Earth Engine. And then let's see what is your other question. Um, can we also upload external spatial data that is not imagery and use it for modeling in GEE? Um, so there's actually a variety of non-imagery based products already available in Google Earth Engine. Um, which includes things like uh, prism, ground data that is displaying air quality metrics, temperature data from the field, things like that, that aren't necessarily um, remote sensing data sets, um, or maybe only have a little bit of remote sensing data included in them, um, that you have the option to access directly through Google Earth Engine. Um, but more to your point, I think uh, what you're interested in knowing is that you can upload any additional data um, this is typically done by uploading a CSV file as an asset. Um, and then after uploading the asset, um, it can also be kept private um, unless it's shared or made public. And so well, to that point, um, that's basically just to say that any data that you're interested in incorporating into remote sensing analysis, modeling, as you mentioned, that's something that you'll be able to upload to GEE um, and use for your purposes um, and calculations within the code editor. I think actually a, a, a good example of this is um, uploading training data for a land classification, and that's something we'll go over next week. Um, but we're basically going to be showing you um, how to 
use an asset that basically shows points of different land classifications um, and use that to train um, an algorithm so that it can classify the rest of an image for land classifications. Okay, question 13. Um, is it okay to not have any info in scripts and assets while using the code.google link? I think this was in reference to um, the link that we provided for today's activity. Um, and I think this, this raises some really good points about how sharing via link works. Um, so you shouldn't have any issues um, with our code in particular, and we, we hope that you didn't, um, because everything that we used was basically called directly from Google Earth Engine. Um, and this is a really good point about uh, the links itself. So if you're sharing a series of code, if everything is readily available in Google Earth Engine, it's all public data, um, and you're say doing your spatial reference based off of a lat long rather than like a shape file, um, you shouldn't have any problem just sharing that code in a link um, and then letting uh, the user use run the code and then see any results that you might be interested in them um, looking over. Um, the only thing that you might run into with this is if you have any assets that are being used within the code, um, just sharing via a link isn't going to make those assets public or shared with whoever you're giving the code to. Um, so an example of this is say you're um, calculating a series of vegetation indices and you're filtering over a shape file that you've uploaded as an asset. Um, you need to make sure that that asset is either made public or that you've shared it with whoever is going to be accessing the code. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to use the asset to, to do the spatial filter. And that's just a pretty simple example of how that, that works with the link and making sure that you've, you've shared all of the necessary elements of your code uh, to make sure that anyone can run it. Great, question 14. So for Landsat data, how can we check whether we are accessing collection one or collection two data sets? Um, and can we access both in Google Earth Engine? So you're, you're able to check all of the metadata um, of the imagery that you're using in the catalog window. So I think in the, the data catalog uh, search demonstration, we showed the, the various data windows that will pop up when you're navigating the data, at least in the catalog. And then also when you search for data, um, directly in the JavaScript API. Um, it will basically show you a window of what the data is, any metadata, what the data coverage is, typically how it's processed or provide you links to how the data was processed as well. Um, so that's a really good source to go to uh, just to make sure that any image collection you're using is, is the one that you're actually interested in. Um, and I think that a lot of the Landsat data available in GEE that we typically see used typically comes from collection two, since it's just a little bit more updated in terms of processing. And I think this collection two is also um, where the surface reflectance data product is calculated. Um, so in our case, within this exercise, using the surface reflectance data, um, everything from, uh, from the data that we imported is gonna be collection two. Um, but I believe that with, with something like a simple print function, you should be able to tell um, exactly where that data comes from, or at least the the name of of the file that you're you're looking at, so that you can clarify that. And I think that both collections one and two are probably available. Um, that's not necessarily something that I've looked too much into, since when I'm looking at Landsat data, I'm typically filtering for you know top of atmosphere reflectance versus uh, surface reflectance, and then also um, the quality of the images, which I think is a, a good segue into question 15. Uh, which is, what is the difference between Landsat 8 surface reflectance tier one and tier two? And so we went over this a little bit uh, within the slides. Um, but essentially the difference between tier one and tier two um, is based off of quality. So the tier one images are gonna be your highest quality um, Landsat 8 images. They're the ones with the least amount of cloud cover. Um, uh, they went through processing and, and quality control successfully. These are the images that you typically we'll have to worry about, I guess, the least in terms of interferences um, from things like clouds, the atmosphere, cloud shadows, stuff like that. Um, and then the tier two images are still very good quality images, um, but they typically have a little bit more influence from, from things like cloud, cloud shadow, and the atmosphere. So they're, they're kind of separated that way, um, just to provide context for the quality of the imagery. And usually when you're working with tier one images, um, it basically gives you the confidence to know that the, the imagery might have uh, the least amount of uh, cloud cover uh, possible within the, the collection that you're working with. 
And for example, I think this is something that we've mentioned a couple of times throughout um, a, a variety of our RSET trainings, but we usually recommend only using um, images that have less than 20% cloud cover. Um, and I'm not sure if that's exactly how it works for tier one, um, but just to give you some context about how that, um, that sorting of cloud cover typically works. I think another another important thing to mention with that that data is when you're working with the surface reflectance product that's been um, pre-processed. Um, there's also a, a QA band there that a QA band, a cloud band, and I think also a cloud shadow band potentially, um, which can allow you to filter simply for cloud cover, simply for cloud shadow, um, and can kind of eliminate the need for uh, more complicated masking. So you can essentially just exclude pixels based off of how they scored in the, um, the quality control phase of the analysis of the product, um, rather than having to do some of your own more complex cloud masking. Okay, question 16. Are the atmospherically corrected data ready for analysis to publish in peer-reviewed journals? So. Um, this is a, a little bit of a difficult question to answer, but surface reflectance imagery is typically ready for your own analysis. And as long as the atmosphere correction is adequate for your work, um, you likely won't need to do any more pre-processing pre of the imagery. Um, so for example, say you would like to do a land classification with this surface reflectance data product. You're probably going to be good to go on that. You can complete your land uh, cover classification. And, and, and I would assume that something that kind of passes this level of quality control would be good for a peer-reviewed journal. But that kind of depends on your own study area. One thing that I'll mention, uh, for example, if you're trying to use, um, say, Landsat surface reflectance data um, for any body of water, say that would be freshwater, um, coastal, inundated areas, things like that, you're going to want to be a little bit careful with the atmosphere correction, because typically um, these atmosphere corrections are completed for land specifically, and some of this works a little bit differently for water. So that's just to give you an example of, of how you should be looking at the atmospheric correction and just making sure that it's adequate for your study area. All right, question 17. If a user uploads their own imagery for analysis through GEE, is this imagery only available to them? So short answer, yes, we've, we've covered this a little bit. Um, once you upload an asset to Google Earth Engine, it's kept private to your account, um, but you can make the asset public if you choose to do so. And question 18, I want to learn GEE. I have zero knowledge of programming, zero knowledge of JavaScript. Um, I, am interest, I am trying to learn Jupyter Notebooks. I don't have a computer science background. Should I start learning GEE using Python or JavaScript? Um, so this is a great question because I'm sure that's something that a lot of you um, are wondering, but ultimately it really comes down to your preference. Um, so in this example, if, if you like using Jupyter Notebooks and that's something you'd like to continue doing, um, I would suggest looking into the Python API in Colab since it basically uses just like a specialized version of a Jupyter Notebook to interact with Google Earth Engine. Um, however, um, the caveat to that is that you'll likely find more learning resources um, in the JavaScript API. Um, and that's just because as we mentioned, um, the JavaScript API has kind of been around for a little bit longer. It's typically used um, a little bit more by developers. So, so you might find that within your own um, search for trainings, tutorials, and things that are going to help you learn how to use Google Earth Engine, you might just find that there's more available for JavaScript. But it really does kind of come down to whatever you're most interested in using. And hopefully the, the demonstration that we did showed you just a little bit about the difference in kind of the user interface and how you interact with, with each of the possible platforms. All right, question 19. Does the filter point tell GEE where the center of the Landsat image should be? So no, the filter point selects the Landsat tile which, can cha which contains the chosen point. Um, so basically what this means is that if you filter by a point as we did um, in our example today, um, Google Earth Engine is just going to select the spatial bound um, that covers this point. So uh, Landsat images are recorded in tiles. Um, and in this case, um, the tile that was selected 
um, includes the point that we provided in the Bay Area. And we were kind of lucky that this tile covers uh, most of the Bay Area within this one uh, tile as well. So um, that's not necessarily something you always see or experience. So you'll, you'll typically find that an area that you're interested in working with um, isn't covered by a single Landsat tile. Maybe it's like a couple of tiles, a few uh, Landsat images, um, but we'll go ahead and show you a way um, next week during our land classification session um, to show you how to filter uh, spatially using a uh, shapefile as a feature collection. In question 20, will we be covering the machine learning approach in this course? Um, short answer, yes. Um, we're going to be covering uh, machine learning algorithms available in Google Earth Engine. Um, and we're going to go a little bit more in depth about the random forest algorithm um, during the next session. Um, so we're definitely not going to give you an inclusive <laughs> approach to machine learning. We're not going to go too much into detail about um, how this machine learning works on, on a wider scale. Um, but we're going to go a little bit more into detail with that random forest algorithm and, and show you one of the approaches to using machine learning. Uh, within Google Earth Engine, particularly for land classification. In question 21, are the images atmospherically corrected? Um, so the images that we used in this activity are atmospherically corrected um, since they're from uh, the Landsat 8 Surface Reflectance Tier 1 collection. I mean, as we mentioned, the, the surface reflectance product, um, what, what really makes that valuable for us is that atmosphere correction. So we're looking at surface reflectance um, directly off the surface of the Earth. In question 22, here in var image, we select the first image of the collection, but how do we select the second or third image from the collection? Awesome, so that's a great question. Um, that's not necessarily a, a typical way that we filter. Um, usually when you're using um, that first function, that typically is in reference to, um, that's typically in reference to whatever the first image is in whatever filtering metrics you've provided beforehand. So in our case, we were basically just looking for um, the highest quality image um, in May, which ended up being, uh, what was that? May 8th. And basically how that image was filtered first was that it had the best um, uh, cloud cover metric with the least cloud cover associated with that image. Um, so that's what we were using the, the first image for. Um, but typically you're not going to necessarily filter that way unless you are only looking for one image. Um, and we'll go over this a little bit further about how to select for images, how to filter images, and then also how to do some, some compositing and mosaicing as well. So I think in the, in the next session, we'll provide a little bit more detail about that. That'll be helpful for, for this purpose. All right, question 23. Is there a certain order of arguments location, date, cloudiness, et cetera, or can they go in any order? All right, let's see. Okay, so essentially when you're, when you're filtering images, there's not necessarily a, a specific order that that has to go into. Um, you can set your filtering parameters um, before or after you import an image collection. You can just use them as a variable. Um, but typically what we like to do is essentially load the imagery and then do all of our filtering after that. So you'll note, note that when we were establishing our, um, our chosen image within the, the example that we provided, we essentially called in the imagery that we would be using um, and then filtered that imagery within a, a series of functions all uh, back to back, line by line. Um, and it doesn't necessarily matter what order you do this in, in terms of uh, location, date, cloudiness. Um, but I would say, if you're if you're thinking about this in a workflow sense, typically what is easiest for me is to first filter by that location, then date, and then go further into the quality of the imagery, which gets at cloudiness. Um, so this uh, kind of list of things that you've provided here is in an order that I would personally use, um, just because I think it's easiest to load the imagery, establish the location that you're interested in working in, um, filter by date, um, and then other quality metrics like cloudiness, water pixels, things like that afterward. Okay, question 24. How do you merge slash analyze imagery with different spatial resolutions? Um, so you can resample and reproject data to reduce spatial resolution. Um, I think that's that kind of gets at the question you're asking here. 
Um, so I've provided a link of how to do this from the GEE developers. Um, but essentially, um, I guess the, the most simple uh, example that I'll give you is say you would like to use Landsat 8 imagery and Sentinel-2 imagery um, within the same analysis. Um, obviously, the, the spatial resolution is going to be different there. Um, most of the bands that you're probably interested in for um, Sentinel-2 are at 20 meter resolution, whereas Landsat 8 would be at 30 meter resolution. Um, so in this case, to, to use both uh, data sets of imagery, you'd probably want to uh, resample and reproject the, the Sentinel data to reduce the resolution to 30 meters instead of 20 meters. Um, and then at that point, um, hopefully that helps you work with the imagery in pretty much the same way and, and use them within, say, um, one collection of images. Um, in terms of merging the data or doing anything like data fusion, um, I, I think there's a lot of different ways that um, this has been approached in Google Earth Engine. Um, that's a little beyond the scope of, of this training, um, but I'll try to provide some more links about how this is done um, after the session's over. Okay, question 25. Selecting the near infrared and red bands and then using the dot normalize difference function, like what are we doing here? Is that only when our data set doesn't have its own NDVI band? So yes, so if your data already has an NDVI band, um, you can feel free to just use that NDVI band. But we were just showing a really simple example of how to calculate normalized difference vegetation index and, and other vegetation indices in Google Earth Engine um, if that band is not already available to you. Um, so in this example, uh, the, the normalized difference function is basically preloaded into Google Earth Engine as a function since this normalized difference comes up in a lot of different um, calculations for different environmental parameters. I'm going to give you a little bit of context about that. Um, the normalized difference function isn't only useful for uh, vegetation. You have things like a normalized difference water index, a normalized difference snow index, normalized difference um, soil index, kind of the list goes on and on with different band combinations to assess different environmental parameters. And so with the, with the ubiquitous nature of all of these normalized difference calculations, uh, the Google Earth Engine developers kind of just went ahead and, and made this a function so that it's easier to calculate those things. And then with our other examples of the vegetation indices, we kind of showed you how to um, complete these calculations for something that isn't necessarily already preloaded into Google Earth Engine. Uh, using the expression function. <clears throat> All right, question 26. Is there a resource similar to R's CRAN manual with a glossary of functions? So I think that there might actually be a, a manual somewhere out there. Um, I, would, I would link you back to the Google Earth Engine developer website, and I'll probably do that here. But one thing that I, I want to mention is that at the very beginning of our work in the JavaScript code editor, um, I showed you that docs tab um, that's to the, what is it, to the left of the screen, um, uh, same place as the assets tab. And you can go to that docs section and basically search any function that you're interested in working in. It will display kind of all of the functions that you have available um, in a list and you can use the drop down arrows to look at what each of them mean and what you can do with each of them. But if there's a particular, um, Thing you're looking to do, whether that be like reprojecting or resampling, something like that, you can just go ahead and pop that into the search bar and it will show you what functions you can use to complete that. Which is really nice because it basically means that you have that reference kind of built into the interface itself. All right, question 27. With GEE, can I do GIFs? Let's see. So, so yes, um, I've provided an example here of how to do this with MODIS data. I mean, I think that's actually the same GIF that I provided in the slides as well. And that's a good, a good screenshot right there. So thanks for clicking on that. Um, it's a pretty simple process, I believe. So if you're interested in taking a time series um, and then turning that into a GIF, um, there's a series of, uh, of lines that you can use to do that. And the script is available a little bit lower on this uh, web page. So we definitely encourage you to take a look at something like this, um, just because it can be a really engaging way um, to present a time series analysis. And you'll notice, I think, yeah, at the bottom of the page there was the code to do that. Awesome. Okay, so question 28. Can you elaborate on the EVI formula uh, used in the code? Why is there a function for NDVI, uh, but not for EVI and GEE? 
Um, could this be added by someone in shared? Uh, for calculating NDVI and GEE, is it better to work with surface reflectance or top of atmosphere images? All right, so to your first question, um, EVI is essentially just another way of, of using band combinations, um, typically available from Landsat or really any other um, multispectral sensor um, that was specifically designed to correct for some issues that happen with really dense vegetation. Um, so for EVI, um, typically that's something that you would want to use for dense forested areas, maybe a, a really dense rainforest or something like that. We just showed an example for the Bay Area picking one of the vegetation indices that we um, that we had already calculated just to show how to map that over a collection. But this is typically something that um, you'll only need if you have a densely vegetated area. I'm into your question about why is there a function of for NDVI but not for EVI and GEE? Um, that's just because EVI is a little bit more complex of a calculation. It's not quite as uh, ubiquitous. Um, as I mentioned with the NDVI, that falls into the spectrum of these normalized difference calculations that are just really common for a lot of different um, environmental parameters. Um, so that's why that, that function is kind of already built into Google Earth Engine um, and not for EVI since it's kind of a more specific calculation um, that has a number of coefficients that, that have to be included in there as well. And so could this be added by someone in shared? Um, I don't believe that the function itself could be shared. You could probably do some variable coding just to automatically calculate EVI with a set of bands from a specific image, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but there are also, and I, I should mention this, there's a series of EVI products uh, available in Google Earth Engine, most of which are deprecated though, so we don't necessarily recommend using things that no longer have support for them. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as you're kind of looking at these different parameters that are available within Google Earth Engine. Sometimes you might want to end up calculating those yourself, um, especially if the data set itself is, is going out of use or will be deprecated soon. And so for calculating NDVI and GEE, is it better to work with surface reflectance or top of atmosphere images? Um, so once again, we would, we would just recommend surface reflectance because it takes away some of the effects of top of atmosphere images. Um, that's not to say that we, we don't condone the use of top of atmosphere imagery. Um, it's something that can be really helpful. Um, a lot of land classifications use it as well. Um, that data set itself has its own uses, um, but if we're talking about um, kind of our um, most ideal standards for calculating something like NDVI, we would wanna make sure that the, the atmospheric influences are corrected for. Um, so we would recommend the surface reflectance product for that. And question 29, how can I export this NDVI within a boundary? In general, I have a vector file boundary of a specific county here, and I want the NDVI exported just for that. Many thanks. Awesome. Well, I, I think these first two sessions of, of this series are going to be particularly useful to you then, um, because we are going to go over um, using a shapefile boundary of a county um, for land classification uh, section next week. Um, and so you can kind of apply things that you've learned from this session as well as the next um, to do something like this. But basically, in short, the way that you would do this is you would want to make sure that whatever vector file boundary you're using um, is uploaded to Google Earth Engine um, as an asset um, for that specific county. And then you would want to make that county shapefile a feature collection, which basically just um, tells Google Earth Engine that it's a boundary that should be filtered by, and then you can filter by that feature collection. Um, so then the imagery itself um, will basically populate only that that spatial area, which can be really good for mosaicing too. Um, so say, like I mentioned before, your um, county exists over two or three Landsat images. Using a feature collection this way can really help you um, get all the available imagery together for your specific spatial bounds um, and not really restrict you to only using one uh, Landsat tile. So it's a, it's a nice way around doing some more complicated mosaicing too. Question 30, the classifiers in GEE are, oh, let's see, the classifiers in GEE are mainly for classification of images. Is there any code or material for implementation, implement regression, random forest or support vector machine in Google Earth Engine? Uh, please do share if available. Yeah, awesome. So in the, uh, I know I just keep mentioning the next uh, session, but in the next session, we're gonna go over um, some of the algorithms that are available in Google Earth Engine. Um, 
for classifying any imagery that you have, doing any other machine learning that you might be interested in. Um, and so off the top of my head, um, I know that there's a naive Bayes uh, classifier, random force classifier, support vector machine classifier, um, and a cart classifier available in Google Earth Engine. I don't think that that's an inclusive list. Um, there are likely others available as well, um, but those are just ones that kind of exist off the top of my head. Um, and then we'll go into how that random forest classifier works in a little bit more detail um, over our next session as well. So if you're really interested in seeing how one of these classifiers are implemented um, uh, for an image, um, it looks like classification of images. Okay, yeah. So for a single image, um, we're going to be showing an example of essentially compositing and mosaicing um, Landsat imagery uh, over the bounds of a county in Maine. Um, and let's see, and that should provide you with a, a good example of how to start doing some of this work. Okay, question 31. In which cases is it better to use GEE before GIS software or other earth imagery analysis processing language? Yeah, so this kind of get back, gets back to, to preference. Um, I think basically what you're asking is, in what cases is it better to use GEE as opposed to a desktop GIS software um, for imagery analysis and processing? Um, and it looks like you're also asking about uh, the coding language as well. <clears throat> So I would say for a lot of the reasons that we talked about earlier, um, Google Earth Engine can be great if you have any computing limitations, um, if you're worried about data storage, things like that. Um, since everything exists on the cloud with Google Earth Engine, those aren't necessarily barriers that you have to worry about. Um, and then a lot of the same functionalities that exist in say like ArcGIS or QGIS are also available in Google Earth Engine. Um, <clears throat> the caveat there is you'll just need to be using an API to do that. So if the coding is something that's a little bit more um, scary to you, or it's not something that you necessarily want to uh, use for, for your entire project, or it seems um, beyond, say, like your expertise in coding, um, I would say using Google Earth Engine for things like image filtering, um, getting mosaics and composites can be really useful, and then you can always pull those into GIS software. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's any specific reason to use one over the other. They both have their advantages. Um, and then in terms of a processing language or, a, or an API, which is I, what I think that you're getting at, um, it really just depends on what you have the most experience with. So if you're interested in um, using Python, because that's what you use as an interface with ArcGIS, um, maybe Google Earth Engine will be slightly more complicated for you because the, the Python API is... Um, a little bit different. It's not necessarily the same as an API for ArcGIS. Um, it really, I guess I'm just getting back to the same point where it's it's something that just is really based off of your own preference. I think when we talk about the advantages of Google Earth Engine, it's, it's mostly because of that cloud-based nature and then your ability to engage with remote sensing data um, with say uh, 50 lines of code um, to do things like import, filter, and calculate like vegetation indices for um, for imagery that you're interested in using. So it ends up being a little bit less of a point and click experience and more of just getting your lines of code down to filter for some of that imagery and, and make sure you're doing what you need to do. In question 32, would analysis slash classification need to be done for each image tile separately or can imagery be mosaic together for further analysis? Yeah, so I think we've touched on this a few times. You'll you'll be able to mosaic imagery together so that you can do the same analysis and classification on um, the images that you need. Um, and basically this just kind of gets back to the point that a lot of the same functions that you're able to use when you're processing spatial data um, in desktop GIS are also available in GE. So you can definitely composite mosaic, um, bring together those uh, pixels and images that you're interested in using um, within one um, image per se so that you can complete the same analysis and classification on them. Okay, question 33. How can we get statistics of the maps created by us? Is GE capable of producing graphs, charts, tables with results for the various analyses? Yes, so short answer to that is GE is definitely capable of producing those graphs, charts, 
um, tables, scatter plots, those things that you might be interested in. Um, and those will typically uh, populate within the console when you're just running them in the in the uh, JavaScript API. Um, and I think we're we're planning to show a couple of examples of this um, in the following sessions. Um, but essentially, it's just a function that you type into the code editor, um, and that will kind of spit out a, a line graph, a, a bar graph, a pie chart, whatever you end up coding um, to display a specific uh, parameter that you've already calculated. Say something like NDVI over a time series analysis, something like that. Um, you definitely have the option to um, display that data um, in whatever way works best for you and then export that as an image. And how can you add a color bar map, a color bar to the maps, a legend? Yeah, awesome question. Um, you can use a, a series of different legend codes. It's something that um, a lot of developers don't really implement until uh, say like the user interface stage of their coding. Um, but we're also gonna show an example of this um, in the following, uh, sorry, in the following sessions, um, just to show how you can display that legend um, directly within the map section of the GE interface. So more to come on that, um, and hopefully that will answer your question in the future. Okay, question 35. Is there a shortcut to commenting and uncommenting several lines of code at once in Google Earth Engine? So yes, there is. That's actually what we used for the headings of, of each of the code sections. You'll notice that we left um, each of the headings of what we were doing within the code uh, uncommented and basically the the shortcut for that is at the very beginning of what you would like to uncomment um, you do a slash and an asterisk and then at the end of what you're interested in commenting you do an asterisk and a slash so I think someone someone's going to type that other way there you go and then you would end it um, with an asterisk and a slash and that will just comment out everything within the bounds of the uh, the slash and asterisk Question 36, is it possible to change the var from point to polygon if we want to process some specific area? So yes, this is definitely something that you can do. Um, basically what you would wanna do is make sure that, well actually I guess you could you could create your own polygon, that is a function that you can do in Google Earth Engine um, to filter bounds that way. One thing that we typically do since we're usually working with shape files of a specific area is we upload that shape file as an asset um, we make it a feature collection, and then we basically just tell Google Earth Engine that we're only interested in mapping over the spatial bounds of that feature collection. And so it works pretty similar to what we did with the, the point, but just implementing a feature collection of a specific area. I mean, as I mentioned before, we're going we're gonna to show a direct example of this in um, the next session as well. All right, question 37. How can we apply the expression as EVI and SAVI for date interval collection and not for a single image? Yeah, so we basically showed you how to map one of these parameters. It was EVI over an image collection. And basically we do a similar calculation to that, but we choose the image collection rather than um, one single filtered image. And then when we map over that collection without doing anything else, um, it will basically just reduce that collection to a mean. So what we're getting is the mean value of all the pixels and then the EVI is calculated for um, that, that mean itself. So it's not necessarily image by image. You can calculate EVI image by image that way. So say you're interested in filtering your uh, date by, I don't know what, what we did, January of, um, I think it was 2021, January of 2021. Uh, to May of 2021, um, and then you can basically tell Google Earth Engine um, to create a separate map for each of those available images. Um, that's something that I think we'll approach a little bit more in session three, um, where we're gonna be taking an image collection and then uh, calculating time ser a time series of normalized difference functions um, over a series of those images as well. So we'll have kind of a, a coded visual example of that for you in the future. Question 38, is it possible to establish the variables before calculating the indices once and for all? Yeah, so you can establish any variables uh, that you're interested in using kind of at any time. Um, the only thing that I would say is you'd probably wanna establish which bound, sorry, which bands you're using before then, because just keep in mind that with any of these variables, you wanna make sure that 
Google Earth Engine is able to reference what each of the points of the variables means. And so in our case, we're, we're typically um, focused on making sure that the correct bands are selected um, from whatever sensor it is that we're using. Um, and then we tend to uh, do things like calculate all the variables um, or at least establish uh, the calculations of those variables. So, so in this case, we we used image sorry we used expressions for calculation of EVI um, and SAVI, and that's something that could kind of be placed at various parts within the code um, just to establish what that expression means. But the way that we showed it to you was basically step by step, just showing the expression, calculating the expression, and then adding it to a map. Um, but like, like I think you're getting at, you could, in theory, establish all of those expressions beforehand and then do all the mapping at once. Question 39, the output for the EVI collection image, January to May, doesn't look different from the original output of the EVI image, May only. Would we normally expect to see a difference or is it just depending on location, technology, time span, et cetera? Mostly I'm just interested to not see a difference between one month and five month outputs. Yeah, so this was a very rudimentary example of mapping over a collection. Um, so in this case, um, we reduced that image to a mean and then it showed basically any area that had green with over the span, within the span of those dates. Um, so I think in our first example of EVI, we were looking at just an image from May where we would expect a lot of green up anyways. So I think that might be why you're seeing um, a lot of similarities between those images. Um, but typically when we reduce to a mean, we're not necessarily using, and comparing that to another image, we're not necessarily using um, one of those same images that was used within the average itself, which I know is a complicated way of saying that, but um, typically the way we would do something like this is say aggregating over a, se uh, over a season, comparing um, yearly seasonal outputs, things like that, where you would expect to see a little bit more of a difference. So you're kind of spot on there um, mentioning uh, phonology and time span and things like that. And I would also say that for the Bay Area, um, there's still quite a bit of green um, kind of throughout the year. Um, so you might be noticing some of those uh, effects of having green vegetation year round. Right, question 40. What's the best way to filter imagery to have uniform lighting? I've come across certain areas where one image is brighter and thus generating mosaics becomes very difficult. So I think one of the few, well, one of the times that I've encountered this is when using top of atmosphere data. Typically when you're using uh, surface reflectance data, um, I would hope that you don't see quite as much variation in terms of the lighted image. Um, but I think this also depends on time of year, um, surface exposure to the sun, things like that, which I believe are actually corrected for within the surface reflectance product. So I'm going to need to look a little bit closer at this question and hopefully I can provide you with some links um, to give you a little bit more context about why you might be seeing this and, and how you can improve your mosaics. Question 41. In the example, uh, the speaker chose a specific date for imagery and has the, that has the least cloud cover. I assume we have to identify it ourselves by looking at the image collection we'll use. Well, actually, so the way that we did this filtering was using uh, the cloud cover band um, that's available in the surface reflectance product. Um, so we didn't have to pick out a date in terms of cloud cover ourselves. Within the surface reflectance products, the, the cloud cover is estimated and it will classify um, a pixel as covered in clouds or not covered in clouds. And then using that identification of cloud covered pixels, we were able to filter for the image that had the least amount of cloud cover. So we didn't actually have to take a look at any of those images to establish which one had the least cloud cover. Okay, question 42. If I wanna use the same code for another area, um, so you have a lot long here. Is it not sufficient to change the center map point? Um, what else has to be changed? So I believe in this case, if that's the only point that you're interested in, um, you can just change that that small portion of the code where you're establishing the lat and long, and that will just change the geometry point that 
GEE is filtering by. And I think you should be good to go if you want to keep everything else the same. And then the map center point is something that you can kind of just leave off. That really just centers the map um, for your own viewing purposes. So if you need to get rid of, I think there was a, a little bit of leftover map center point code there that, that you don't need to worry about. And question 43. In this example, we have seven images of the region. How could I display all seven images to assess them individually? And can you go over the dynamics of a future collection in a single image? Awesome, yeah. So if you're interested in mapping all seven images of the region, um, that's just gonna be a difference in filtering. And so we'll show this a little bit more, um, like I mentioned in the last session where we're gonna be establishing an image collection and then mapping a time series over those images. Um, so I'd say definitely stay tuned for that. Um, and we'll we'll show basically a, a way to just map all seven of those images um, and then display those maps within the, the map section of the interface. And then the dynamics of a feature collection in a single image. So feature collection is essentially like, say, a, a feature that you'd expect to find in something like ArcGIS. Um, and a single image is just one image. So feature collection um, is something that we tend to, to map over. It's not necessarily just like a single image or a single point. Um, whereas that single image is just that one image from that single date. Um, it's not a collection of anything. Um, and we kind of have that one static image. I, I believe that's what you're asking, but I'll go back through this and, and give you a little bit more of a distinction between the two after the session, because I know we're about at time. So I want to go ahead and finish up real quick. So question 44, I'd be very happy if you include how to import and use training points for classification, accuracy assessment, and GEE, would you include it? So we'll definitely be going through uh, the classification and accuracy in part two. Um, so definitely join next week. Um, it's the same time, the same link. Um, and we'll have this recording of part one up on the web page. Um, yeah, so that's just basically a, a really nice way of saying that you should definitely uh, stay tuned for part two of this. Um, and we'll be going through that exact thing that you've asked for. Awesome. So I think that's where we will cap the questions. Um, just two minutes over. Uh, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us. Um, and thanks for asking so many great questions. Um, so we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.